some of you, especially our international guests, may not know that this is the first time in Canada's history that we have a Minister of Citizenship, Immigration, and Refugees. So that in itself is a signal to, to our country. And on that note, I would suggest, Minister, to everybody that congratulations on your, are on, are, should be on the record. 25,000 Syrian refugees, 29th of February. I believe there are a tad more than 25,000. In fact, promises made, promises kept. Well done. Well, thank you. We actually got them in two days early on the 27th, so we didn't yes. even need that extra leap year date we thought might come in handy. <laughs> yes. So then, let's stay with promises. Prime Minister Trudeau made a promise to the people of Canada that this was a government that was going to be open, it was going to be transparent, it was going to be accountable, but he promised something a little bit more, something intangible, and he promised us sunny ways. So what do sunny ways mean for your portfolio, for immigration, citizenship, and refugees? Well, I guess it means a few things. You could say sunny towards the other political parties. <laughs> yes. I don't, we, may, we have made a number of changes to citizenship, revocation, to uh, refugee health care, et cetera. But I don't dwell on what the others did with which we disagree. I focus more on looking to the future. So we talk about sunny ways, but there's the odd cloud in the sky. But generally speaking, we try to be, uh, you know, uh, polite to our opponents. But I think that, that term has a more meaningful aspect to it in immigration. We want to be sunny ways towards newcomers. Uh, if I had to put it in a, sim a simple way, uh, we want to welco welcome our newcomers with a smile. We want the average immigration officer to be focused way more on letting people into the country than on keeping people out. So in part, this signifies a lot of changes that we will be doing, and some of which we have done. But in part, I think there's a change in the culture, a change in the attitude, which we will be uh, seeking to implement over the years. So let's carry on with sunny ways. Uh, to a large extent, uh, there was a shift in the Canadians, in Canadian attitudes and their expectations, and, and that resulted in a landslide victory on the 15th of October. But we do know, and you know probably better than I do, that public opinion is a good slave but a bad master. What do you tell Canadians who say, as you are welcoming 25,000 plus Syrian refugees, what do you say to people who say to you, what about our homeless people, our young people without jobs, our native populations, our sick, our okay. elderly? How do you keep well, that Well, I say up? you can walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> there are always going to be poor people in Canada. I think one of the greatest things on which we're mandated to make progress is uh, First Nations people, Aboriginal people, Indigenous people. And we're certainly spending a lot of money on that, if you look at the platform. <coughs> so I make no apology to anybody. In fact, if anything, I boast about it. The fact that we are one of the few countries that is m being more welcoming to refugees rather than shutting the door or inching the door shut. I think that is a good thing. And I think when you think that this is the worst refugee crisis the world has known in decades, there are literally millions of people displaced. It is causing huge problems in the European Union, uh, which we hear about every day. So I believe we are doing the absolute right thing in taking 25,000 people from the horrors of a civil war across the ocean and welcoming them here at home. And most Canadians agree with that. And so I am delighted that most Canadians agree with that. And it doesn't mean that we will not take measures to help others in Canada who have difficulties, notably Aboriginal people, but others as well. We can do more than one thing at a time. So let's talk about that one thing, uh, which is Syrian refugees. It's absolutely fantastic. As chair of Lifeline Syria, I cannot express to you my appreciation 
collectively for what, what is happening in Canada and what is happening in the city. But I also hear good news for Syrian refugees is bad news for other refugees. And today we heard uh, that there are two classes of refugees in Canada, first class refugees who are Syrians and the rest are second class. What about that? Well, I wouldn't use that characterization, but there's an element of truth. This was a special project. Uh, we pulled out all the stops. It was a big campaign commitment. We galvanized the public service to do real change. One definition of real change is you do something you've never done before. I don't think we in this country had ever done it so fast. And so because all of the refugees were coming over on leased planes, uh, we didn't charge them if they were privately sponsored or government. And so that is a difference from other refugees. Uh, but we couldn't sustain that forever. At least we are reviewing this uh, uh, loan program where refugees pay for their own flight, mm -hmm. and we may change that, but that is up for consideration with many other things uh, in the next budget, including poverty among other Canadians. So here's an example of your balance between do we help Aboriginal people or poor people at home, or do we make it free for refugees to travel to Canada? That's a question uh, that we will uh, have to address. But uh, I, I do think that uh, we are also uh, not penalizing refugees from other countries. Uh, I checked this out. We are not diverting resources from other refugees to Syria. We are diverting resources from some places to that. But the other refugees are coming in as they normally do. Some would say, and I would agree, not fast enough, not quickly enough, too much bureaucracy. Yes, that's true across the department. But it's not worse for the other refugees as a consequence of Syria. And that's the point I am, I am making. So just sort of think back on the last three months. It's been an incredible journey you took, and you've, to some extent, you know, claimed success, rightfully so. What was the biggest challenge? I think the biggest challenge was in the first uh, two or three weeks, when I suddenly found out I had this job, and we <laughs> had to get the machine up and running from scratch, and I had no staff. Nowadays, it's a life of luxury. I have staff, <laughs> the machinery is running, and it's a whole lot more relaxing than it used to be. Now, don't get me wrong, there's still a lot to do. There's a lot more to immigration than just the 25,000 refugees. But those first couple of weeks with no staff and with the whole machinery to get up and going, that was probably the most uh, challenging part. I went over to Jordan twice, Lebanon once, and the civil service was you know, in high mode to get this going, to do something they'd never done before. The military played a key role in helping out on the medical processing. We were afraid about exit permits mm -hmm. being not possible in Lebanon. We were concerned about everything under the sun. Uh, so it was a frenetic period. It was a busy period. But, you know, I think, it, uh, I think we're getting the job done. So it's definitely worth the effort. Perfectly. It is definitely worth the effort. Let's go to a, a question larger than one file. We have international guests in the audience. And by and large, they believe, and I know this when you travel, people believe that Canada is the gold standard in multiculturalism and integration. Do you think this is true? And where do you think we must improve? I think I am very slow to tell everybody that Canada leads the world in X, Y, or Z, because you hear that all the time. And most of the time, it isn't true. You know, let's be honest. We don't lead the yeah. world in innovation. Yeah. There are many things we do not lead the world in. And yet you hear Canadians, including some from my party, claiming we do everywhere under the sun. So I use that very sparingly. But there's one area in which I do think, I don't know if we're the gold standard, but I think we do quite well. And that is in multiculturalism, in welcoming people, in integrating people, in making people feel comfortable. And I can say that, especially as Member of Parliament for Markham, uh, for the last 15 years, which is according to StatsCan, Canada's most diverse city or municipality. And so Markham is a case study of this, where I think a hugely multi-ethnic, multicultural society has in fact done 
extremely well. So I do think we, we are leaders in that area. Uh, we do not have a party that is explicitly anti-immigration. There are other countries, many countries in the world who do. I mean, we argue with the conservatives or the NDP about this and that, but we don't argue about whether immigrants are a good thing or a bad thing. And I think we stand out a little um, in that regard. So I do think we have that tradition, and I do think that is why it has enabled us, the government, to bring the majority of Canadians online in this project, and why we, unlike many other countries around the world, are actually welcoming newcomers with a smile, welcoming refugees with a smile, and not telling them to go away. So I do agree that that is one of Canada's uh, strengths. So this is a conference about cities of migration. So I want to move from the national to the local. So we say that immigration, or parts of immigration are national, who gets in, who stays out, who becomes a citizen. But integration is largely a local experience. So what comments do you have? What role do you see for cities in the 21st century in helping you manage integration? OK. Well, first of all, at the risk of offending cities, since I'm having a conference about cities, um, it's not just big cities. Okay. Uh, and this is, I think, a, a really important point. I remember Paul Martin, when he was prime minister, had a new uh, infrastructure program, which he referred to cities. And he got so much attack, his line was, there's no hamlet too small. So it's not just big cities. The last thing we want is the refugees to all be in Toronto and Vancouver and Montreal, where the housing is super expensive. And in fact, if you look at the settlement of refugees, we're now up to 58% have found permanent housing. In the last week, it's gone 52 to 58, even though we had a big influx of refugees just in the last week. So that's good news. But the highest percentage not settled are in Vancouver and, and uh, Toronto, and so they are fanning out across the country to the smaller centers who may not have quite all the services, but they are also very welcoming and they have lower rents. So it takes, it's from Victoria to uh, uh, Cape Breton, Sydney, Nova Scotia, and everywhere in between, big and small, that are uh, taking the refugees. But to get to your point, maybe I was missing it a bit, the first stage of getting them from A to B is largely a federal thing. Mm -hmm. We get them from there it's to okay. here. But once they get here, it's everybody. It's not just cities, it's not just federal government, it's provincial government, it's settlement organizations, it's companies giving money from CN, $5 million, little children welcoming signs, everything in between, communities coming forth. It, it's why I said it was a truly national project. So at the beginning, I called every provincial counterpart. Between them, they, they contracted for more than our 25,000, so they were keen. I called well over 30 mayors. One thing I discovered is you can't call five mayors, because then the one. rest get all yes. grouchy. <laughs> you have to call at least 30. So I did, and they were all on site. So cities play a huge role, but I don't want to just limit it to cities or towns or villages or hamlets. Or, Across the whole country, people of all kinds and all shapes and sizes from all different kinds of communities are all helping out in a terrific way uh, to make this a success. So I'm going to stick with cities. Okay. Okay. Uh, being Oprah. Well, I've lived, I've lived in one all my okay. life, so I have nothing against yeah. cities. Yeah. Okay. So I think you've had a chance to look at the collection of good ideas that we have on our website, Cities of Migration. Many of these ideas come from completely unusual places outside Canada, small cities, large cities, New York, Melbourne, London, Barcelona. Which idea would you like to see imported to Canada? OK. I did pick one, but I wasn't okay. thinking so much about imported to Canada. Okay. I pick think we idea. already do it. Mm -hmm. But I'll give you one that did catch my eye. It was uh, Copenhagen. And yeah. I've been there a number of times myself, and I know they all ride bicycles. And I was impressed that they had a big campaign on to ride bikes. And a lot of the r bike riders were older women from places where they typically would never ride a bicycle. I'm not sure we need to import that. We already have bicycle riding in this country. But I thought that was a great innovation. 
I'll give you one other example, which happens to be in Canada, St. John, New Brunswick. Uh, there was a story of refugees arriving there, not speaking a word of English and, or a word of French, and that, by the way, is absolutely typical of our government-assisted refugees. Uh, and a restaurant owner specializing in Middle East food was so relieved that he finally had somebody who could cook the food. And this person didn't know a word of English, so the way he learned was the restaurant owner translated the menu for him so he could then both cook the food and learn the language. So I think that's a good example of how a refugee hits the jackpot in St. John, New Brunswick. Very good ideas. Uh, so I have a stack full of questions okay. here. And I have had very little time to actually curate them into, into sort of envelopes that can address a theme. And we'll try our best to get through all of them. Uh, here's a question from Hilda Nouri, a Ryerson University student. What will you be doing if, will you be doing anything to address the refu refugees and immigrants who are being detained in detention centers and jails across Canada? The refugees who are being detained in jails, I didn't know there were any. I guess refugee claimants. Uh, I'm not quite sure of the context of that question. We do have a fair number of people under detention, uh, not necessarily refugees. And there was a case of a child, child who was under yeah. detention. And in that case, we actually made sure the child was able to stay in the country. Um, I don't want to pass the buck, but that does come under public security. Uh, my colleague, Ralph Goodell, and I know he's undertaking a review of the degree to which detention is used. Uh, our impression is that the that the pre I, here I, I'm trying to stay sunny, that the previous government used what we would consider a somewhat excessive use of detention. So we are uh, reviewing that situation. Okay. This the next question moves us to something I know you're very interested in, okay. which is uh, waiting times for spouses of Canadians wanting to come to Canada. 28 months. This question comes from Agneska Weiner. What co concrete steps? Will CIC take to reduce the punitive waiting times for spouses of Canadians, 28 months, waiting for their applications to be processed? OK, well, I didn't plant that question, but it does happen to be <laughs> my top priority. I mean, refugees are really important. Um, and that was the first item on the agenda. There was a certain urgency to it. But Ratna, you talked about domestic troubles versus international. Well, here, here's another example. The big international one was the Syrian refugees in the last few months. But on the domestic front, there are many. But one of the biggest is that it, it takes an inordinate amount of time for families to be reunited with each other in this country. Uh, I think, on average, it takes some 24 months for a husband and wife and small children to be reunited, whereas countries with which we compare ourselves, like UK, US, Australia, typically take six to eight months. And I, as a Canadian, am quite uh, devastated, ashamed, shocked that our performance in this critical area should be so terrible. And so it is in my platform letter, and it is one, of, I would say, the top priority to get this right. And so we have already committed additional funding to hire more people, to interview more applicants. But it, it's more fundamental than that. It involves a change of how we do things. There are some processes in immigration that are probably not necessary. We learned from the refugee experience how to do real change, how to do something you've never done before, how to process refugees faster than we had done before without, I would argue, increasing risk. So we can take that learning experience from refugees and apply it to families. What can we do to do things concurrently rather than consecutively, to apply risk management, to use other techniques to improve our own efficiencies so that we can um, monitor and give answers to all of these cases much more faster and thereby bring down the processing times? It's not going to happen overnight. You don't change a battleship on a dime. It's going to take a number of years to get the job fully done. 
But I'm telling you, if there's one thing on which we are totally serious and committed, it's that. That's great to hear. Next year when you come back, we'll ask you about but that I, promise. Uh, you, okay. you see, I can say it's a mess for maybe a month, two months, and because it's a previous government's mess. But I can't say that for very long or it becomes my mess. And so that gives us an incentive, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because we don't want to be described as having a mess to get this job done as quickly as we possibly can. So here's a question from an academic, an important one, from Lewin Goldring from York University. Does your government plan to improve data collection on immigrants, refugees, and other immigrants, including temporary residents, so that we can study in integration indicators over time? You know that the previous government did not, well, some people said did not like science and evidence. I so, would never I'm, say that. Yeah, That's you would not a very sunny comment right yes. now. <laughs> well, I'm not Prime Minister Trudeau. Well, you're not part of our group. Yeah. OK. You have no obligation to be sunny. I have no obligation. Neither do we. We put up with a certain number of clouds in the sky. But what's your question? <laughs> Indicators, data collection, evidence gathering. Yes, we would like to. This is not my department. I don't know the details, but we certainly want to improve the quality of the labor market information because when a company says it desperately needs somebody or other for a job, um, it's good to know from evidence what the real situation in that market is, and often we don't have it. But let me just jump to a related issue very quickly in terms of evidence. We are going to have major studies over coming months and years to get evidence on how well or how badly the 25,000 or more mm -hmm. Syrian refugees are integrated into Canada. We are going to monitor that. We are going to enlist uh, research through SSHRC and other means so that we have a true evidence on, as a case study of how well we do or how well we don't do in this uh, project, and then we will have lessons learned uh, for the next time around to do it better. I, I, I think that's very important. You know, 25,000 is a, is a cohort one can follow over time yeah. and, and learn from. So staying on Sunny Ways, the, the audience really likes that. They want you to keep talking about It was your idea, not sun. mine, to have that theme. Okay, but Sunny I Ways. It. But Carl Flecker says, along with Sunny Ways, there are a few clouds. Yes. And he comments on the persistent cloud of credential recognition for skilled workers. What will your government do beyond tinkering with who gets in? You can always fix the immigrant who comes in. But what about fixing the systems and processes in Canada for credential recognition? Well, it's not tinkering with who gets in. These are decisions that affect people's lives in a fundamental way. And to get them in faster makes a huge difference, whether you're a refugee in the middle of a civil war or a husband or a wife waiting for 12 months to be with each other. Uh, so the issue of credentials recognition has been with us, I would say, for decades. Yes. One thing about our government is we do not pretend to be able to do things that we cannot do. And the point is this is a provincial area of jurisdiction. The jurisdiction over the rules for accountants, doctors, engineers, nurses, whoever, professional associations are in the hands of the provincial governments. And I know our predecessors once claimed in an election that they would fix it. That was not true. All they had was a computer in an office, and if anybody asked about it, they referred it to the corresponding province. So we cannot fix this alone. Uh, I know it's a big issue. I think we can work with provincial governments to try to <coughs> uh, persuade them or help them to fix it, but it's something that is in provincial jurisdiction. So I think it was last week that a new parliamentarian from Western here in Toronto, Ahmed Hussein, tabled a private member's bill. And the private member's bill dealt with a related issue, which is not credential recognition, but unconscious bias. We know from research that if your name is Matthew, and you have a certain set of credentials, qualifications, and if your name is Samir, you have exactly the same set of credentials, uh, experience, uh, everything, 
is the same except your name. If you're Matthew, you're 40% more likely to get screened in for a job. And Ahmad's bill talked about anonymizing resumes for the public service. That is a lever the government of Canada has a control on. Okay, that's not to do with credentials. No, but, but it's related. it's a good idea. Okay. Uh, and right. I think that there was one of your examples from a Chelle. city in Germany yes. which did a similar thing to have credentials anonymous as to sex or name or other characteristics that what might produce such bias. I think Ahmed Hussein, I know him well, he's a great MP and he's one of about four or five or six of our new MPs who were themselves refugees. Refugees, yes. Yeah, including my, my uh, colleague Mariam Monsef, who's a 31-year-old minister who was a refugee from Afghanistan. So look, I definitely think that's a good idea. We want to reduce bias in the hiring of public servants, so why not? Well, we're happy to hear you say it's a good idea because we've actually had webinars and seminars about it, and there's a fair amount of enthusiasm. Well, I think it's good. But please bear in mind, this is a private member's bill. Uh -huh. I am not telling anyone else what to do. Every member of parliament is free to vote the way he or she uh, wishes to. So I am telling you my opinion, okay. which is positive. Well, it's a, that's great. <laughs> Sticking with sunny ways for international students now. Will you make it sunnier for students to stay in Canada after their studies and have an understandable, understandable path to citizenship, if I'm reading that correctly. So I think it's got to do with making it easier for international students to complete their studies and then uh, apply for permanent residency in Canada. Okay, I don't know if you're hitting my favorite topics on purpose, well, but you know, international I'm students. I'm Oprah. <laughs> I've been a professor longer than I've been a, a politician, and I have a very high regard for international students in the sense that if you are looking for the perfect immigrant, I think their profile is about as good as any group because they are by definition educated, they know something about Canada, they speak English or French, so what better group to go after? And they are sought after by countries with, who, with which we compete because we all have aging populations, we're all after skilled new immigrants. And so one thing you don't do to the group you're courting is to punch those people in the nose, mm -hmm. which is what the previous government did, and here I'm not being so sunny, but just factual, <laughs> what the previous government did when they took away the 50% credit that international students had previously had in order to become a citizen. So we are uh, restoring that in the same bill where we take away citizenship revocation. We think they have earned that. But more important, is the ease or difficulty with which they can become permanent residents. It is more difficult now, I believe, than it used to be. I think that is the wrong direction. And so we are going to be reviewing the whole express entry okay. system. Mm -hmm. That is almost brand new. In opposition, we didn't really say much good or bad about it because it was so new. But now we're looking at the good things and the bad things about it. And one of the things I definitely think should be improved is that it should be more positively inclined towards international students than is the case today. I, I, I have I think, some fans out there. Yeah, I think we're all delighted that uh, we, we got to know the Minister of Refugees very well. Okay. And we're getting to say hello to the Minister of Citizenship, and we like what we see so far. Well, thank so, you. Let's get back to refugees. Uh, here's a question from my colleague at Refugee Korea Jumpstart, Mustafa Alio. 25,000 Syrian refugees is 0.07% of the Canadian population. Canada welcomed over 60,000 Vietnamese. Should we not be welcoming more Syrians considering the gravity of the situation? Well, maybe. But let me say first that my hero or he heroine in the world on this issue has to be Angela oh, Merkel. Yes. Because we have lots of Germans in the audience. Yes. I'm not saying that because there are Germans in the audience, but to the extent they are welcome. But I'm saying that because Germany is a country that has welcomed a million or more refugees. And we think we've done a lot, and we have done something when we admit 25,000. But it's absolutely nothing 
it's a, it's a drop in the bucket compared with what Germany and certain other European countries have done. So I really salute Angela Merkel for taking a strong and principled stand mm -hmm. on this extremely uh, difficult issue. Now, should we do more? Perhaps we should. I'll be announcing our levels of immigration mm -hmm. uh, next week. But let me just tell you, and here we get back to the domestic versus international. Um, there's more than one group that wants to expand the number of immigrants. I'll just give you three. You just said we should take more refugees. That's one. I, I asked the question, oh, but yes, I do agree. All right. So that's one pressure point. If you think provincial governments who are, have been really, really positive on refugees will be okay with the idea that they will take less provincial nominees even for one year to accommodate refugees, then you have not spoken to those provincial ministers because they won't. They would not be happy. So we don't want to reduce economic immigrants. Many people want more, and maybe they're right. Even though we currently have a pretty weak economy, there's no reduction in the appetite, at least on the provincial side. And then I've been talking to you quite strongly about spouses. Mm -hmm. The only way we can reduce the processing times is to let more in, okay? So there you have family class, we want more. Economic immigrants, we want more. Refugees, we want more. We want more of everything. Well, to get more of everything, you have to bake a bigger pie, as my yes. former colleague used to say. And there's a, so how many immigrants in total do we want? And I can tell you that I, for one, want more. But we have only a certain capacity in the short run to increase our numbers. So in order to have more refugees, we have to develop a capacity to allow in more immigrants overall, and that's a part of what I was saying earlier about re-engineering our processes. So it's part of a bigger picture. Yes, we want more refugees. We will have some more refugees. How many exactly remains to be seen. But there are a lot of other things we want more of, and we have to balance those competing demands. So just on that, which is the, the numbers that you table every year, because the world is in such a fluid state and crises happen, in one place opportunity rises in another, isn't it wise to consider multi-year plans as opposed to single-year plans? That's a brilliant idea, and it's exactly <laughs> what we're about to do. I think it's your idea, then, if that's such a brilliant I'll idea. The, I'll give the credit to Oprah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> this is a really interesting question. It doesn't say where it comes from, so I apologize. How can Canada's response to Syrian refugees be a template for engagement on future mobility crisis like displacement caused by climate change? Ooh, that's a very deep question. Well, we've developed a certain expertise so you could keep liberals in power forever. That would be one way. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lighthearted comment. Um, I think we have learned from this experience. I've already said what we learned in, in terms of doing things quicker and more efficiently hopefully can be transplanted to doing things quick, more quickly and efficiently for other kinds of immigrants like family members. And I think once you learn how to bring in 25,000 Syrian refugees in a quick and efficient and humanitarian way, you can transfer that knowledge to refugees from other circumstances. So the issue will not be, is it possible to transport X number of people from some part of the world which is suffering from climate change to Canada, <coughs> the issue will be what I was talking about earlier, competing demands on limited funds. How much money are Canadians collectively willing to put up in order to uh, transport people in distress for whatever reason from where they are today to Canada? And it's possible that the numbers involved on climate change, who knows, we're probably talking a long way into the future, mm -hmm. Nobody five years ago would have guessed millions of people from a Syrian refugee crisis. So it's very difficult to predict the future. But there could be disasters around the world for any number of reasons into the future. And I think we've developed 
and the public service, more importantly, uh, so they'll still be there, whatever the stripe of the government. Um, so we have the capacity to do the job. The question will be to analyze whatever the, the crisis happens to be, and do we have the will, the resources, to respond to that compared to other priorities of the day? So I think we're coming to our final question, okay. unless there is you know, something else that emerges still from the floor. This is a very interesting question. It comes from a young guest from Berlin. She asks, how can we learn from refugees and conduct integration with them, not for them? That's a really good question. So good I don't have an answer off the top of my head. Um, it's difficult in the current situation. I'm going to have to think about that. I honestly don't have an answer. But let me just end by giving you a profile of our current group of refugees, the government-assisted ones from Syria. Talk about vulnerable. It's difficult to imagine a more vulnerable group of people because on average, they speak not a word, not a word of either English or French. Yeah. They, in general, have very little education. They, in general, as you've seen in the media and as I've seen at airports, they have many, 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 many children and in general, they have never been on an airplane in their lives before they came from there to here. So this is a group that really needs the support of Canadians. I believe they will do well, and especially all those children will do very well. But they will not do it on their own because they come from a very vulnerable background. So I think it will take and as you point out, it's, this is not just the federal government, not even mainly the federal government, to provide the language training, the education, the social integration, all of those things. It's all, all of Canadians that will be involved. But that will require a lot of work to bring people from such a, um, a difficult point of departure to become fully functioning Canadians. I think we've done it before. I think a lot of the Vietnamese boat people were not in great shape when they got here. I think we've done it with uh, people from Uganda. I think we've done it with many, many other groups of refugees. There are always bumps along the road, uh, but sooner or later, hopefully sooner, they do thrive, they do prosper, they do contribute to our Canada, to our country. So how we will ask the people I have just described to tell us how they can help us, I don't know. Uh, it's something to talk about. But, you know, we always like to say, we don't say governments know everything, so maybe it's a better, a good way for me to end with a question where my answer is, I don't know. So let's have some research. Remember, we like research. Yes, we like Do research. some research and give we us like a good answer to that question. Thank well, you all. I, just on that, I know what I will say. Refugees arrive. They, they have challenges over time. They learn English, they get jobs, they buy the first home, they buy the second home, they become citizens, they start businesses. After 25 years or more, look at the Vietnamese refugees. So many of them are sponsoring Syrian exactly. refugees. So many of the Ugandan refugees are sponsoring Syrian refugees. So I think there is an, a, a trajectory, but it takes time. It takes time. It takes time. On that note, may I ask all of you to thank, help me in thanking our Minister of Immigration. Thank you. Citizenship and Refugee. Thank you, Rabbi. Very well done. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much.